Jarvis Church is one of the most talented mm-hmm. Uh, musicians from one of the biggest, coolest bands in the history of Canadian music, the Philosopher Kings. He's here with us right now on Meet Me for Coffee. How's it going, Jarvis? It's going great, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, we we mentioned this off the air. You look exactly, you haven't aged a bit, man. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I know, maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jarvis Church, the name, uh, there's a lot of history behind it. It's the intersection, one of the intersections in Toronto. Uh, Jarvis and Church. Not quite an intersection. Oh. They're parallel. But I used to live between Jarvis and Church uh, in okay. downtown Toronto. Yeah. And and what what inspired you to name yourself after uh, that these streets? Well, like I said, I mean, I've always you know been real proud of Toronto, and I always kind of wanted to rep Toronto. And um, I like I said, I lived between Jarvis and Church. I was in this a building called the Merchandise Lofts. And it was um, a really cool area, cool neighborhood. Ryerson was right there. You know, Eden Center was right around there. Um, so, yeah, I just thought that'd be cool. And um, I was just driving one day with my buddy, and I just, we passed, you know, Jarvis, and I saw the sign that we passed church. And then I was like, hey, Jarvis Church, that'd be a really cool name. It, it really is. And I'll tell you this, at my my days in AC radio, contemporary radio, I never got sick of your songs. So this is great that we're doing this. Um, I like it. Nice. Thanks. Um, I, I find that a lot of the CanCon stuff up here in Canada, we have a bit of a rule for all radio stations. They have to play like 35 to 40% every hour. It has to be Canadian music. Um, it's really not helping the, the artist right now at all. It's more... Uh, you know, Justin Bieber or Drake or uh, people who have those those big contracts uh, with the the pull, the big money from the states, right? Yeah. Um, well, what's your stance on that? Uh, you make a really good point. I mean, I think there was a time when, I mean, the, the, the idea behind the whole thing is that we're right beside America, this massive, you know, powerful media uh, icon on the planet. And some of our culture can get sort of steamrolled with all this culture that's coming out of America. So let's protect some of it. Um, And I guess the idea is, you know, what happens is the Canadians just go to America and sign an American deal. And then they're actually, they're no longer really, you know, although they're from Canada, they're actually signed to American companies. So um, I guess to your point too, there's just so many superstars in the world that are Canadian um, that, you know, it really seems like the Canadians that need the help might not be getting it. I I'd fully agree. They're superstars. We would think that, you know, the philosopher Kings are big superstars here in Canada, but over in the States, you know, it may not be to the magnitude that we think it is, right? It's no, it's not even, nobody knows us in the States. We're only in Canada. We, nobody knows it's in America. It's just, we're just, and yeah, we're just a Canadian band, which means, um, you know, only this population of thirty, you know, thirty million or so know us. Well, you know what? It's it's a uh, really inspiring to look back. It, it kind of makes me feel a bit older, uh, knowing what much music did for the music community. Helped a lot of bands like Phil- the Philosopher Kings, putting them on the Much Music Countdown, which we all watched at the time with bigger bands uh, from the states and mixed them all up and help bands. Uh, you know, benefit from, from being on some program that was, had a a big reach and you were able to be on the same playlist as some of the, the bands that you like to listen to, right? Like silver chair and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, What, what needs to happen in the community, the community of Canadian musicians to get back to what we had in the nineties? Um, I guess I think maybe the CanCon distinction should apply to artists that are independent or on Canadian record deals. It's funny that like the Philosopher Kings, we were signed to Sony, a big deal, a big label, but we were signed to Sony Canada. So it's very different than Sony America. Sony America has their own artists, their own A&R, their complete, their own radio programming, all that. Um, and, And you actually can't go to America because you know, it's like you're signed to Sony Canada. So you're actually locked into a Canadian deal, which ultimately every artist is trying to get an American deal so that it becomes international because that's how it works. You know, 
music goes from America to the far corners of the planet Earth. But music doesn't leave Canada, just like music doesn't leave Italy or, or you know, like you don't have the hits that are huge in Italy. We don't know who their stars are. We don't know who the stars are. And barely we barely know the stars in England. You know what I mean? Um, but everybody knows who the American stars are. Um, so that's kind of why it, as artists, we're trying to get on that stage because it's really a world stage. Have you guys ever tried to get an American record deal or was that in the works? Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. I have a, kind of a funny slash tragic story about that. Yeah, that was, of course, our main focus. So our biggest album, you know, our first album had charms on it. It was a hit. So we actually got signed to Columbia, uh, the, the American version. Right. So we were down there with the Fugees. We were down there with um, uh, who else was on that tour? Um Maxwell was on it and just you know we were we were signed to Columbia and the album was okay we had one hit it's time to make a new album well we decided let's make it in America with an American producer so we, we chose this producer Joe Niccolo from Rough House Records and his partner they were in the Columbia family and they ran Rough House Records so we said great so we made Famous Rich and Beautiful in Philadelphia it had all our hits on it Cry Hurts to Love You um and then we, you know, we're about to release it in America. We're finished. And one of the, our, our bandmates starts having an affair with the label president's mistress, who was the secretary. They just, you know, they got into this big fight. Philosopher Kings, they said, pack up, get out. We got dropped and sent home. And that was it. And we were so, what was so funny is we were so young. We were like, screw them. Like, we don't need them. You know what I mean? Like, we'll just we'll be fine. And we were fine, you know, we we're like, great, Canada, you know, and, and those songs were hits in Canada, but, you know, that's one of those moments where, you know, if that hadn't happened, all those songs would have been released in America and America wouldn't know about the Philosopher Kings. You heard that first here on Meet Me for Coffee. <laughs> uh, wow, man, like, yeah, you, your songs, you know, they're, they're immortalized. You know, when people hear your, your music, I know I showed my sister, um, you no, know, we're only seven years apart, but we we used to watch Much Music Countdown, listen to your songs on the radio. Like, uh, it's like wow. Like, and then we went through like David Usher and when he had his solo his solo career, right? Um, you know, Moist, and then we got pretty deep into it. High Holy Days, just an hour ago before I talked to you. Um, so fun. many great, so many great bands. Um, are the Philosopher Kings planning on getting back together, recording another record at some point? I don't think so because we just did that and it wasn't like it wasn't very it was tough man it wasn't you know it wasn't easy for me personally like you know like the band is exactly the way it was when we started in the 90s everybody's equal everybody does their own thing no one really is a leader no one else no one really sort of like um it's just sort of like you know let's make music and see where it goes and I, you know, when I was young, I, I didn't mind doing that. But just as I've gotten older and as a producer, when I make music, it's usually where I have something in mind and I want to, like, make that thing that I'm hearing in my head. And that's just really hard to do in a band like that, you know. So um, I just, you know, I just think for me personally, it's just it's gotten a little bit, you know, I love playing with those guys and they're still my family. I love them to death, but I'm not really trying to make any more music uh, with them, I don't think. When you first met met the guys, how did it all work out? Did they were they looking for a vocalist or? Oh, we were just friends from high school. We were just, um, you know, it was me and John and Jay, the, the John Jay Levine, and then um, we we met um, uh, we met uh, Craig Hunter and James Bryan in, at U of T, uh, and then Brian West was a friend of theirs. We all kind of got together, and um, yeah, we all kind of you know started that whole thing um which was which has been great it's been an amazing journey and everybody has been very successful doing a lot of different things you know brian and i produced nelly Furtado and canon and stuff like that so there's a lot of um a lot and then there's prozac too there's so much great stuff that came out of that right. you know so um it's uh it's just uh yeah it's been <laughs> it's been an amazing journey well, I hope I can have Prozac on the show one day. I think a lot of people will go pretty crazy. Um, at what point did you know that the Philosopher Kings, uh, something was going on that was really 
unusual. I mean, it, it was gonna something was gonna happen with this music. You know, we felt that right from the beginning. We were just really, um, we were really, we just really believed in it. You know, we really believed in putting in the work and really um, learning your instrument well and really um, studying your craft well and just, uh, um, yeah. And we just had a real, uh, you know, a definite confidence and, um, and, and it all happened sort of relatively quickly for us, you know. Um, as soon as we started, pretty much we got signed. That's amazing. So you you go from the music, uh, playing the music to producing. You discovered Nelly Furtado. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go about you know how you got into the producing originally. Yeah, well, um, I think it's just sort of a natural progression. You know, when you when you're especially when you're part of a band, um, you know, you you want to start being more specific with the stuff that you're creating. Um, I saw Nelly at a talent show in, in Toronto, the Honey Jam, where they showcase, you know, young girls from and women from, from Toronto. Um, and uh, I think it was at least Palace. This is probably 1999. Um, and um, I thought, you know, she was just up on stage singing, like with her eyes closed, but she just had this sincerity to her voice. And she was doing an original song. Nelly's always been an incredible songwriter. Um, so I just was really struck by that. Um, and I asked Brian, my guitar co-bandmate, to uh, you know help me produce Nelly's stuff. And uh, and he said, sure. And then, you know, the rest was history. She was um she was real successful. Absolutely. And then she went on to do that record with uh Timbaland as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. I, I She's a fantastic artist. Uh, there's mm -hmm. so much to say, you know, um, with Canadian music. Yeah. Uh, who's interconnected with this person? Whatever. But I've got to say the Philosopher Kings, uh, your, your group, you guys are all very, very talented. Uh, you've branched off. All of you pretty much have done something different. Um, how do you you manage your, 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 your production career and, and your songwriting career? Um, how do you wear different hats? Like, for this, the Jarvis Church project that you're in, the solo project, do you produce your own songs? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, no, I don't produce my own stuff because I can't. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I think you know a lot. A producer is like a director, you know, and the the singer is like the leading character in a movie, and you, you need to have that third person perspective. You know what I mean? to um to really uh to really see what what the audience sees because that's the point like you can't you know when when you're creating music or you're creating a movie or you're writing a book you're not doing it for yourself that's like there's this illusion that like people think well artists or you know singers are just like they write those songs if they were singing by themselves playing to the wind it's it's not true they're they're making those songs to entertain people with them you know what i mean so it's all about what the people like, you know, how did, you know, so if somebody is a genius, but they make music that nobody likes, then nobody cares. <laughs> if somebody is very, very simple minded, but they make music that everybody loves, then everybody loves them. I mean, it's, it's not about how smart you are or, or how it's about like, like I always say Terminator, the movie Arnold Schwarzenegger in that role, is the best acting there is. You know what I'm saying? He could, get a, he could get an Oscar for that. Now, clearly he can't act the same level that a lot of Oscar winners can, but in the right context, you can make something, you know, that transcends, which is kind of the, the idea when you're making an album. So that's kind of how I look at it. So I, I need for sure a producer to have a vision and then direct me. And it's it's funny that I'm, I'm working with Kanon again now um, we just recently linked up and we're going to make a new album and we've been talking about just this, uh, this journey that, that I swear every artist takes Nelly, Kanon, myself, like we all, when you start off, you make this album, it's successful. Then you want to be your own director. You want to be your own producer. You, you, you have a hard time giving up that sort of direct directorial role to a, another person. Do you know what I mean? And then you meet like five different producers. So some of them 
Ari, the director, some of them let you direct, and then you end up with a hodgepodge kind of album that nobody really understands because nobody has been producing it like the way that Quincy Jones and, you know, great producers have a vision and create a body of work. You, you know what I mean? That's that's always what I'm trying to do is a body of work. It's not just a song. Absolutely. Kanon, what a talented artist. Uh, that, that's that's a name I haven't heard in a while. Um, mm. Wave and Flag was a massive hit. Yeah. Um, I believe we even had Justin Bieber on that song as well. I think he I think he may have on one of the remixes. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. became a superstar with that. So do you have any any insight in how these remixes work? Like, do they, because they come up with the original song, and then do they just go back in the studio? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the managers, play? record companies get together, you know, they are the ones that own the masters, and they decide what they, you know, like, how can we make something that the people will love? Let's take this and a bit of that and put it in, out for Christmas. You know, I mean, that's that's what they're trying to do, yeah. So they're always getting stars to, you know, guest on popular songs for sure and uh you got a new soul station record uh that's in the works right now um yeah. let's talk about that uh, how excited are you i'm really excited you know i haven't done a show i started the soul station series really as as a as a vehicle to kind of work with my live concerts because like you know since around 2010 2009 i've been doing you know a lot of shows um with the with the soul station um, and, you know, I would do these different series and spotlight these different artists. Uh, volume one was Sam Cooke. Volume two was uh, Curtis Mayfield. And then this new one is um, the, you know, probably the most, I mean, probably the most uh, uh, exciting, I guess just overall exciting is uh, the music of Bill Withers. Um, he's just, you know, I, I grew up on his music. Um, it's funny the, the one of the remixes of lean on me by club nouveau was one of my favorites at when i was in high school that was an absolute uh banger for me um but yeah so just approaching this music and then i think i just got this idea i wanted to produce it in a more of a modern way just because i wanted to flip it so i've taken like four of my favorite bill Withers songs flipped them in the kind of modern production and then i produced and wrote five originals that are sort of like modern looking. Um, and I called the album a tribute to Bill Withers and beyond. And that kind of like gave the beyond is futuristic house uh, vocal shifting and all that kind of stuff that I love to do. I love to hear and wanted to experiment with myself. Well, I, I can't wait to hear that. You know, I, I heard the just, just the two of us cover that you did. Um, it's so refreshing, right? You know, there's, there are people who go into it and just record the same song. I feel like this is almost a new song, right? Yeah. So um, is that your outlook? You want to maybe change things up, um, throw your own influence into your own flair, and then, you know, bring the song together? Uh, at what point do you know that it's the right way to go? Yeah. Uh, well, it's funny. I just have to keep tweaking it until I like it. You know, I like I tried Lean On Me. I did like three versions, four versions. I couldn't get a version that I liked. So I, I didn't put on the album because it just, it wasn't fresh to me. But um, just the two of us, uh, I just got a real nice vibe with it. Um, an amazing Canadian artist, reggae artist named Amoye is singing the the, the, the backups um, on that one. And my sax player from the Soul Station, uh, Lester McLean is on the sax and, and uh, the great Wade Brown is doing backups on it. Um, and it's just, yeah, again, it's just something that I think people are going to like because that's sort of, sort of like what I like. You know, like my, my tastes have always been very similar to what's, what's on the radio, you know, like what people are, are into is kind of usually what I'm... It can be very, very weird sometimes messing around with somebody else's song too, right? Yeah. Yeah, especially like one of the greatest singers of all time. You know what I mean? All these, you know, a lot of people, I've done some interviews, they're like, whoa, the cojones on this guy to cover, you know, Bill Withers and, or anything. And, um, you know, like my approach, I've never really... You don't like, hear that. I, you I don't hear that. This, this sort of movie analogy to a song, right? Where like... 
I've never tried to impress anyone with my singing. You know, I, I find that a little distasteful when a singer is kind of like showing off. It's the, to me, it would be like if an actor was like overacting just to show you that they can cry even though the scene doesn't need them to cry. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, it's a, it's storytelling. You know, you, you have a song is a story and can you tell it in a believable, sincere way where the listener like feels what you're saying? And that's something that I know I can do. I've been doing it for a long time. You know, I mean, it's, it's not about, am I the best singer? No, of course, Bill Withers is a much better singer than I am, but I can still, you know, learn these lines and take on this role and tell this story and do it in a way that, you know, I think people, you know, just, it just sounds like a story. It doesn't sound like a singer trying to sing. Yeah, man. Um, I know you, you're, you're originally from Jamaica. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, this show is called Me for Coffee. I'm enjoying some uh, Jamaican blue coffee, actually. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. Um, blue Mountain uh, Coffee. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice wad of cash to get it, but um, yeah. it's a, kind, of a, a kind of a treat for me. Um, how do you take your coffee? I take it with um, coffee made. I know it's terrible, but I, I like sweet, creamy coffee. I, I always have. But I do uh, grind it. And, you know, I got a coffee machine that grinds the beans and stuff. Right. So I like Pete's, you know, the Major Dixon's uh, strong blend, I think is what. I just got into coffee like three years ago. It's really my girls. She always laughs at me because she's like, I've never drank, and now I'm so addicted to it, like so addicted to it. Like, <laughs> hey, it's all good, man. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, your origins in Jamaica. I overheard that you went to a very cool concert, your first concert, um, and that inspired you to be a musician. After is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, Bob Marley's concert in Jamaica. He. Um, brought the two boring political factions together and was dubbed the one love concert um and yeah my family was at that concert and i was uh you know i was like maybe seven at the time um but six or seven but i remember being struck by just the magnitude of what was happening like how important music uh is you know um i you know to see bob marley up there with the prime minister and the leader of the opposition was, was uh, you know, it was very, uh, I think that definitely gave me a, a sense of the gravity that it can have. Uh, it's a, it's a very world. empowering moment. And uh, you discover your right of passage officially. Yeah. Uh, Jarvis, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to speak with me. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jarvis Church, um, you may have heard him on the radio many times up here in Canada. Um, and I uh, could have been in the United States uh, with the Philosopher Kings, but I'm sure the Jarvis Church, uh, these songs, they got to be everywhere, man. Um, I really believe in what you're doing. Always have. Uh, Thank you. 1996 Juno Award winner with uh, the Philosopher Kings. Sound, and there's so much more to get into. But for now, let's leave it at that. Thank you so much, Jarvis. Take care. All right, let's brother. do it again. All right, man.